Elden Ring launched little over a month ago as of publishing this video, and it quickly and dominantly became the current hottest thing in the entire gaming industry, casting a shadow over anything and everything released around it, before and after. It launched to a remarkable amount of critical praise, a rare situation where the commendation was truly universal, and a record-breaking amount of commercial success, selling 12 million units in only 17 days. From Software, a Japanese game developer who was considered niche at best only 11 years ago, has become a giant that managed to make a game that passes even Skyrim in terms of launch window sales. And it's a new action RPG IP at that. It's a feat that very few could pull off, and even fewer who would truly live up to the expectations. With the undeniable success of Elden Ring, I don't think anyone in their right mind would deny FromSoft as one of the modern-day greats in the business. I played the game too, and I released a nearly hour-long review of it. A link to it will be in the description. But to make a long review short, I loved many aspects of the experience the game offered. I love the build variety, I love the setting and characters, I love the Ashes of War mechanics and the cool spells, I love the music, I love the pacing of most fights, and I love the freedom from the taint of day one DLC and obscenely expensive microtransactions that a lesser company would have forced onto the game. But following the very high profile launch of this acclaimed title came an incident, the embarrassing display of tone deafness from other developers, particularly one from Ubisoft and one from Guerrilla Games, criticizing Elden Ring for having a poor UX and poor quest design. Not that the game is perfect in either sense, but neither of those things are representative of the totality of Elden Ring's experience, and these comments come off as bitter and lacking in any introspection as to why their own games might be considered inferior. Those remarks, made on Twitter, were rightfully met with anger from players, as this was a disgusting show of egotism from people who are FromSoft's Western peers. It's especially shameful that one of these individuals works for a studio owned by Sony, who was graciously given one of the best exclusives for the PS4 by From Software in the form of Bloodborne. Eventually, Elden Ring's raving, borderline once-in-a-generation success also led to a very important question being asked. How will this success affect the development of other games? It's a no-brainer that other studios are going to try and emulate at least some of Elden Ring's systems and mechanics. But which ones are they going to copy, and most importantly, will they actually understand why and how these things work so well in Elden Ring? Or are they just going to make misinformed assumptions and end up creating pale imitations that function poorly within the context of their own game? Chances are, it's going to be the latter. When Zuli the Witch asked which wrong lessons other developers will learn from Elden Ring, a pretty significant portion of the replies mentioned the open world, and how From Software did an excellent job with Elden Rings, which will undoubtedly be misunderstood by other studios looking to imitate. This made me think a lot on how Elden Ring's open world manages to be so immersive and engaging and content loaded, and with minimal direction given to the player on top of that. In my review, I gave an extensive amount of praise to it, and I would say it's probably the most impressive aspect of the game. Exploration feels entirely player-driven. But how? Elden Ring's World of the Lands Between is an addictive theme park of equal majesty, discovery, and danger. It effortlessly sparks the fire of exploration within the player's heart by proudly displaying jaw-dropping environments and impressive draw distances stuffed to the brim with a vast catalog of enemies, many dungeons to dive into, useful items to reap, and awesome-looking landmarks that you want to see up close. Once you hop on your faithful steed Torrent and ride in any direction, you'll stumble upon something worth taking a detour for every 30 seconds or so. The game not only throws a smorgasbord of stuff for you to investigate, but it also throws a ton of rewards at you for doing so, and they're always worth getting, even if they might not fit your build you're using right this second, or you haven't begun the side quest it's related to. Elden Ring cultivates a habit of player-driven exploration by virtue of simply having a world that's incredibly interesting, and it totally avoids the usual UI or UX elements that other open worlds depend on in order to accomplish the same thing. 
but usually with less enthusiasm on the player's side, either by a small margin or a canyonous one. It was a risky bet on FromSoft's part, but they're no stranger to risk. And it was a bet they ultimately won. So what makes Elden Ring's open world work so well? And how does it compare to other open worlds? Well, let's talk about it. Open world games aren't new. They go back a while. Depending on your own definition or criteria for what makes a game open world, the concept can go as far back as the early 80s. However, what's considered the starting point for what we know open world gameplay to be right this moment is Grand Theft Auto 3, which set the standard that has been used ever since. It offered a fairly large map, at the time, of many different types of urban environments placed within its setting of Liberty City, and let its players traverse across this world with whatever means were possible inside the limits created by the game. If players wished, they could avoid the main story missions for hours on end to wreak unparalleled chaos just for the sake of it. You could steal any car you saw, shoot or run over any pedestrians you wished, and enable a plethora of different cheat codes to give yourself a ton of money, a ton of weapons, spawn a tank, manipulate the game's physics, or turn all of Liberty City into a violent wasteland by making all those nameless pedestrians kill each other. This was a groundbreaking amount of autonomy the player could take advantage of. By today's standards, it's a bit primitive and even a little restrictive, because story progress was still extremely linear and there ultimately wasn't that much to do outside of killing and stealing. But when GTA 3 released in 2001, it redefined what it meant for a video game to offer a sandbox experience. Obviously, you couldn't do literally anything you can do in real life, as that's a level of scope that is borderline impossible to accomplish, even now, but Grand Theft Auto 3 allowed an amount of freedom that no other single-player game had. As the years passed, the open-world formula has improved upon dramatically. Maps are becoming larger, game physics were becoming more complex, and allowing for realistic ragdolling or destruction on a much bigger scale, more side content was being created to hopefully take better advantage of those growing world sizes, and some games were allowing for more non-linear story progression, particularly RPGs where you could side with different factions and reach one of several endings, or perhaps reach several of a few dozen endings, depending on how the game does things. The gradual evolution of the open world concept also affected true sandbox games where there's little, if any, endgame goal to speak of, and the main appeal of the experience is to just do whatever you want and progress in any direction you see fit. With the widening adoption of the feature and constant raising of the standard of what a good open world is, it should come as no surprise that some franchises or developers found themselves caught up in a variety of game design habits they couldn't help but do. One of the more egregious ones that drew a lot of criticism is Ubisoft Towers, which leads us into topic number one, railroading and info dumping. Ubisoft Towers were a mechanic where a player needed to climb to the top of a major landmark in a new area of the map in order to uncover it and mark several other places of interest. It sounds like a convenient mechanic at first, but once you see it in so many AAA open world games, including non-Ubisoft games like Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor, you start to see why it can get bothersome. The biggest reason is, it streamlines your exploration of the world, whether you want that or not. Whenever you climbed to the top of a Ubisoft tower, you weren't just given a chunk of the map in greater detail. The game also flat out pointed at places of interest on your behalf directing you to spots you should be heading to next. It sucked away the motivation to explore for the sake of it, because if the important spots were just shown to you, you probably assumed that there was little of interest between those points. Basically, a game tries to offer an open world to call your playground, but then goes out of its way to try and section the game off into specific areas you should beeline to anyway. It totally robs you of any satisfying investigating or mapping you might wish to do on your own. It's all information the game just gives to you. To make matters worse, in some games, you have to do these towers to make story progress. And then you do this game after game after game, and they function the exact same way, and it just becomes insipid and actively immersion-breaking, in spite of any convenience they might offer. 
Thankfully, in more recent years, more open world games have bucked this trend entirely and have opted to give more natural and uninterruptive ways of putting new information on the map, and without coming off as trying to nudge you in one specific direction or another. One major one is The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Funnily enough, the game still has towers, but when you finish them, they don't dump a bunch of icons on you. They only reveal the topographical detail of the map so you know the major geographical attributes of the area. This offers a better idea of what the region contains and how you can explore it without explicitly being told what to look for or where to go. Elden Ring takes Breath of the Wild's improvement and takes it even further by completely getting rid of the tower aspect entirely. When you enter a new area of the Lands Between, a bit more of the fog of war is cleared, and you're given the shape of the region you've entered, but with one tiny icon of a small monolith somewhere on the brown, empty space. This is the location of the respective area's map, and it's often near a main road that leads deeper into the new region. When you approach the monolith, acquiring the map piece is as simple as walking up to it and picking it up. You don't even need to dismount Torrent if you're riding him. You just snatch it and leave, and voila, you automatically have all the topographical detail of the area the map covers, including ravines, forests, buildings, bodies of water, hills, and bridges. You didn't need to fight any enemies or partake in any platforming to get this information. In fact, you don't even really need to grab the map piece at all in order to progress through the game. It's solely something for convenience. Like Breath of the Wild, the game also doesn't immediately bombard you with a bunch of icons to look at, so you have a huge checklist of new things to do. Icons only appear on your map after you've discovered places of interest yourself, and on the very, very rare occasion that an NPC makes a mark on your map for a side quest. Most don't. With this system, Elden Ring gives the player the bare minimum of important map info in exchange for the little effort of simply going to it and picking it up and it reveals details of the world without revealing anything that can be parsed by basic reasoning skills. If you look at the map and see a big tree, you can safely assume that it's a minor Erd tree and likely has something important to grab. If you see something resembling a broken building on the map, you can probably guess it's either a church holding a sacred tier or a ruin with an item worth grabbing. If you see a massive, complex layout of rooms and corridors with an outer wall, it's probably a legacy dungeon that you'll need to go to eventually to progress the story. Elden Ring also features an extremely minimal UI when it comes to pointing the player towards progress. The only thing the game does that directs you to the next key location is on the map. When you explore enough, you'll eventually find a grace out in the open world that directs you to the next grace in a series of them that eventually reaches the main boss of the area, typically at the end of a legacy dungeon. That's it. These little pointers on the map are the only thing the player has to rely on when searching for the next story boss, with maybe the very rare snippet of dialogue from an NPC. And that's all that is really necessary. It creates a clear distinction between what's progress and what's optional content. If you're following the Grace Trail, you're on the way to advancing the story, or at least tackling a major foe. If you're not, then you're doing something else. That's the bare minimum of information that player truly needs. The game doesn't spoon-feed you the info, it just takes a step back and allows you to exert a bit of mental effort to deduct what that thing is on your own and let you decide if you wish to go there immediately or put it off for later. This meager amount of extra decision-making freedom goes a long way in creating a sense of player-driven exploration. The spirit of discovery is not found in a game that shoves you to the next objective and treats its own world like a large checklist of tasks like you're about to go grocery shopping, streamlining your experience to the point where it could have been made into a linear game with few meaningful changes. It's found in a game that motivates you to follow or avoid the roads, cross the lakes, climb the hills, scrub the forests, or scour the plains at your own pace and in the order you decide because you simply want to, not because you're told to, which is what all of those icons popping up at once feels like they're doing. Another important piece of evoking a desire to explore is art design. It's not always enough to simply open your world up and let the player pick and choose a direction to go. Sometimes you have to inspire a starting point by creating one within the environment itself, 
One of the best ways to naturally draw a player's attention is by creating interesting landmarks that catch one's eyes when gazing out to the horizon. One recent game that did this excellently was Ghost of Tsushima. It somewhat suffered from the icon checklist I mentioned before, but it ultimately played its world design quite intelligently by having a very minimal HUD and all-around gorgeous art direction that made even the most mundane things steal a person's attention and make them want to investigate it. Tsushima's jaw-dropping aesthetic wasn't simply for the sake of it. It was a powerful tool used to create that sense of exploration without the need to constantly remind the player to do something or look in a certain direction because they were already looking everywhere to simply embrace the beauty of the game. One of its best ideas was having the wind itself guide the player in place of a compass that other games would have. It also helped that it had an extremely fast and easy to use photo mode, so even pretty scenery with nothing interactable was attractive to a decent amount of players just for the photo op. And that includes me, and I rarely ever care about photo modes in games. Ideally, a world is designed to create an intuitive trail of these distinct landmarks that eventually lead the player to a major progression point. It allows for the streamlining that other open world games try to push, but without the actual pushing. It's important to allow the player's own curiosity to ultimately drive them from point to point instead of pounding it into their head that they have to go there right now. Even if they still have a choice, it doesn't really feel like they do when the game's UI elements or even incessant reminders from NPCs continue to pester them to do something in a particular order and with urgency. But by staying calm and allowing the player to go where their curiosity takes them as they're drawn from one beautiful or attention-grabbing spot to the next, the game can give a much greater opportunity for the world to truly immerse them. This is not to say that I think all games should get rid of icons and minimaps or something. I'm saying that Elden Ring's world is so distinctive and readable by itself that it doesn't need those things to begin with. When you stand in one spot and scan your surroundings, the beautiful landscape that looks like a wallpaper no matter what direction you point the camera in is thoroughly decorated with recognizable and intuitively placed landmarks and it's usually easy to see where you are in relation to them. In my 70 plus hours of playtime, I have never once been confused about where I was on the map. I never had to stop and think about my environment because I was confusing my immediate surroundings with a different place. If the lands between were any less thoughtfully designed, then the lack of UI would be user unfriendly. But it is thoughtfully designed, so it gets away with it. Cooperating with art design in tandem is draw distance. Far draw distances are a major boon to open world design, as they allow a player to truly grasp the vastness of the land they're occupying. Some games do an excellent job at managing to convey the scope of their little universe by actually allowing the large majority of the map, if not all of it, to be seen from any decent vantage point and for everyone to distinguish potentially important landmarks and fascinating geography. You can have near ones in the form of simple ruins to create a short-term goal for the player to accomplish, then slightly farther ones in the form of massive castles looming over the landscape for a medium-term goal, and then very distant ones to provide an idea of where the player might be anywhere from 30 to 80 hours from now or more. Elden Ring has the beautiful art design and impressive draw distances to simply bombard the player with how much stuff is crammed into this world from the get-go. Even after you finish the tutorial areas and walk out to the first step site of grace in Limgrave, all you have to do is pan the camera slightly to the right, and you catch a glimpse of one of the last major locations in this story off in the horizon. It's one of many eye-catching things you can see from that one spot in the very beginning of your journey, and it's only a taste of what the lands between has to offer. It gives an accurate sense of scale and also puts the game's verticality into perspective, as the world map is designed in such a way that as you progress the story, you're actually climbing higher and higher above sea level. You're conquering a mountain as you inch closer to the end credits. This verticality is also expertly utilized in regions like Liurnia, where the academy stands high above the marshes, and in the Altus Plateau, where you can go into small canyons and ravines. This grand scope and density of noteworthy landmarks immediately gives the impression that there will be a ton of things to do in this game, and thankfully, that impression ends up being true.
And then the game does this again once you first enter Liernia of the Lakes and overlook those vast marshes of the region, and you're hit with the realization that this still isn't everything. And it's not just the same bland biome we would see in a lot of other games with little imagination in their world design. It's not just forest and grassy plains alternating between one another, interrupted by maybe an occasional swamp or a hill. It's all mystical and fantastic, befitting of a world created in cooperation between FromSoft and the experienced fantasy author George R.R. R. Martin. It just begs to be explored. One aspect of open world games is how it transitions between exploring and interacting with the world at large to diving into smaller, more focused pieces of content within that world. If you don't know what I mean by that, let me give you an example, one you're likely to understand because the game in question was so popular. Red Dead Redemption 2 I and a lot of others really loved this game, and for many good reasons. But the one glaring weakness this game had was how the freedom of exploration was completely stripped away once the player began a story mission. When you weren't doing a mission, the wide open wilderness was available to you. You could hunt, you could rob, you could buy clothes, you could explore the world just for the sake of it. When the game released, I saw countless people talking about how they ended up ignoring story missions once Chapter 2 began because they got caught up in a bunch of random but entertaining nonsense for 10, 20, or 30 hours. But when you finally did start a mission, that freedom disappeared in a puff of smoke and the game forced you to stick to an intensely restrictive script if you wished to complete that mission in a timely manner. They were completely on rails, and fail states were present everywhere and over the silliest things. You could fail a mission for capturing or killing an enemy too quickly. You could fail a mission for arriving at a destination too soon. You could fail a mission for mounting the wrong horse. It was ridiculous. And it was never actually communicated by the game that you could fail in these hyper-specific ways. Rockstar got so caught up in telling their story, it completely clashed with the ideals of having an open world game to begin with. It was like Red Dead Redemption 2 was two different games merged into one. One game that offered the massive map an appropriate amount of freedom to do whatever you wished. And one game that was hyperlinear and hated even the slightest deviation from objectives. These two halves were in constant direct conflict with one another, and it was jarring. If these two games were separate, they would both be excellent on their own merits, but they were crammed into one experience. And while most people still loved the game, some absolutely didn't, and it was because of this. People who were fine with sticking to the strict script and basically playing the part of Arthur Morgan as they would an actor in a movie still ended up enamored with the game. But, those who would repeatedly try to exercise the freedom they didn't actually have to complete missions the way you would normally expect a true open world game to allow, would drop the game out of frustration. A lot of games try to maintain a consistent level of freedom as the player goes from simply exploring the open world at large to focusing on a specific mission or area, so that transitioning from one to the other is smooth. Elden Ring is FromSoft's first attempt at a game of this scale, but they had ample practice at creating large maps that had a lot to offer, both directly through gameplay and indirectly through world design. Starting with Dark Souls 1, the games had interconnected Metroidvania-style stages with lots of looping paths and shortcuts. It helped make the games feel huge even if they actually weren't once you zoomed out a bit. But beyond that, the worlds of Souls games always had a ton of implied land area that was between major stages. You need only look at the surrounding landscapes and horizons to grasp this. Even though a huge chunk of what you see was nothing more than unplayable backdrops, they were still there, as part of the universe. The big change is that Elden Ring has finally made these areas reachable and part of the interactable world. Legacy dungeons in Elden Ring, such as Stormvale Castle or Rhea Lucaria Academy, are basically regular Souls levels, and the surrounding area you see when you gaze beyond their walls are what would normally be those fancy backdrops serving to imply the scale of the universe you're inhabiting. But the game closes that gap by finally allowing you to venture out there and see the lands that connect the major locations together. 
Like Red Dead Redemption 2, you're basically playing two games, but instead of directly contradicting each other, they now form a functional whole. When you're out in the open world, exploring ruins, checking out landmarks, and diving into catacombs, you're playing Elden Ring. But when you enter a legacy dungeon, like Stormvale, the Academy, or the Capitol, you're back to playing regular Dark Souls. It's a sensible and painless transition that doesn't have any conflicting design elements. They're not butting heads like in Red Dead. They're now working in tandem to provide a greater and more cohesive overall experience. Another major element of open world games that many probably don't really think about as they're playing unless it is truly awful or truly amazing is traversal. Obviously, in a game with a huge map, methods of travel are just as important as combat, because the larger the world is, the more time you'll probably spend on the road, at least until you finally unlock the majority of those convenient fast travel points. Bad traversal options stand out the most because they make the already potentially tedious act of traveling even worse, feeling like nothing but boring downtime away from the real action. But when the act of moving from point A to point B is entertaining in itself, then it no longer feels like downtime, and instead feels like an extension of the gameplay loop. The most perfect example I can possibly give of this is Insomniac Games' Spider-Man. It's pretty guilty of having a world populated by icon checklists, but it makes up for it by having the most engrossing and maybe even addicting method of travel in almost any open world game. Swinging. If you've played the game, then I don't need to explain how great it feels to pick up speed and zoom between buildings using a variety of methods as the beloved web slinger. Insomniac made the undeniably ideal decision in trying to replicate the swinging mechanics of the Spider-Man 2 game from the 6th generation of consoles, and improving on it for 2018 standards. And the result was immersive, physics-based traversal where webs actually stuck to real in-game geometry, additionally supported by an excellent sense of speed. It was a rare game where you probably never wanted to use fast travel because your normal mode of transportation was actually too fun to not do. If you got really good at it, it felt like you were speed running through the game. Elden Ring sadly does not have web swinging. As you might expect in a fantasy game, the primary mode of transportation, aside from fast travel and your own two feet, is your spectral steed, Torrent. A lot of open world games have horses, yes, and they're not necessarily bad. By and large, they are perfectly serviceable, but they typically don't do much beyond being faster than running by yourself. Torrent, on the other hand, isn't a regular horse. He's fast enough that he has a place in open-world fights against large enemies that move around constantly, like dragons or other mounted warriors. Torrent also has a very useful double jump that can effortlessly get you over any short obstacle that you couldn't pass otherwise. In fact, there's some instances where it's too good and could allow for sequence breaking. Plus, there's wind currents Torrent can utilize as a sort of super jump that can shoot you far up along a cliffside to reach a spot that other games would force you to ride the long way around for. And then there's the game's generous fall distance and the fact that the mounting and dismounting animations actually have pretty generous iframes on top of all that. So while Elden Ring doesn't have anything as interesting or fun as swinging around between skyscrapers, Torrent is designed in a way to be convenient and reliable when it counts, and actually get you to places you normally can't go, or at least can't reach so easily on foot. He's not the most unique and outstanding form of transportation in the grand scheme of things, but he does exactly what's expected of him, and perhaps a tiny bit more. Torrent isn't an active detraction from the gameplay or the surrounding world where you sit and wait for multiple straight minutes of downtime to reach your destination, like driving in early versions of Final Fantasy XV, which was completely hands-off and on rails. Instead, Torrent feels more like an extension of the player, and you can call upon or dismiss him without really needing to think about it because you can grasp what he's good for or not fairly soon after acquiring him. And finally, the last and most important trait for making a good open world, content. If you're going to create a large, expansive map, you need to populate it with things to actually do. It's one thing if your landscape is beautiful and the draw distance is impressively far, 
but it's another if nothing you see is meaningful content that adds depth to the world or your interactions with it, nor offer any rewards. This lack of worthwhile things to do is why announcements of games having massive 50 square kilometer maps is starting to be met with dread more often than fanfare. The bigger the game's map is, the more content it'll need to be adequately populated so that the player doesn't end up traveling 15 minutes in any direction without stopping and doing anything interesting. At least for a time, back when open worlds were still climbing in popularity, a lot of games simply didn't put forth that serviceable amount of content, and opted to simply let the game's size try and impress people on its own by merely existing and being huge. This was the epitome of quantity over quality, and some games are still guilty of it in the last few years. A fairly recent offender of this would be Rage 2, a game that was actively trying to sabotage itself by doing anything it could to distract from its fantastic combat. Its open world was far too big for its own good, because anything that wasn't combat was detrimental to the experience, and the game spent too much time making the player drive across a very bland map. It would have been a sincerely excellent game if its map were much smaller, or even better, if it was just linear like Doom. Every second spent outside of fights, especially while driving, felt like pure downtime where you were simply sitting around and waiting to finally get to the action. In cases like this, the open world aspect just comes off as little more than bloat meant to artificially inflate the average person's playtime, constantly distracting the player from the actual gameplay loop they're truly there for. The ideal way of making your open world feel full of meaningful content is to Give it that. The most engaging open world games offer something to do seemingly every few minutes or so when you're traveling across the map, whether it be as simple as another group of enemies to fight, or those cool landmarks I mentioned earlier to investigate, or an absorbing side quest to start or continue. In some cases, games might even offer mini-games of varying depth for the player to lose themselves in for hours at a time, totally distracted from any sort of story progress. It's a much more effective method of inflating the player's total playtime, and one that's even met with praise if the minigame is seriously that good. The best example I can possibly give when it comes to open world games stuffed with content, story related or otherwise, is the Yakuza series. Granted this is cheating a bit because the Yakuza games are much smaller in scale compared to titles like Assassin's Creed or The Witcher, and they are set in a real world, modern day country. But when it comes to an open world game giving the player a seemingly endless feast of fun or worthwhile stuff to do, Yakuza is second to none. You can do any of the dozens of wacky, entertaining, or surprisingly touching sub-stories, you can participate in complex mini-games such as hostess club management, kart racing, or real estate, many of which have plot lines of their own that can last up to several hours. You can do simple mini-games like darts, karaoke, or blackjack. You can also hit up the arcade to play actual, real-life Sega games like Super Hang-On or Virtua Fighter 5. The vast, unparalleled selection of side content is one of the biggest reasons why this franchise continues to steadily grow in popularity. Obviously, Elden Ring, being a fantasy game set in a world of swords and magic, won't have an arcade, though it would be cool to find an illusory wall hiding a PS2 with Kingsfield in it. So. What can the game do to populate its huge map with worthwhile content? Well, it probably goes without saying, but a Souls game's greatest attribute is combat, and everything immediately related to it, like build variety. With that in mind, the best content to fill the world with is more opportunities for fighting, but not just for the sake of it. Worthwhile rewards are important too, and these opportunities must have a decent enough variety of contexts so that repetition doesn't become overpowering enough to cast a shadow over everything you do. Thankfully, the vast region of the lands between is stuffed with many different forms of side content that urges the player forward toward unknown challenges for items, spells, or gear that could potentially empower them to greater heights. And this content varies in length, too. There's dozens of open world boss fights where you're immediately put into the action, oftentimes without any knowledge or preparation on your part. 
There's also several Ever Jails, where you can fight bosses in a more controlled environment, but you can't summon spirits, making it a more honest one-on-one. -on -one. There's many ruins that offer a small area of enemies and or another boss protecting a rare item. There's a few small forts that you basically besiege and loot like a one-man army. There's abandoned churches that offer sanctuary on your travels and usually have a sacred tier in them waiting to be picked up or an NPC to talk to. There's a collection of catacombs and caves that are akin to Bloodborne's chalice dungeons, mostly short and linear little areas that end with yet another boss encounter. There's also a few graves, which are basically bigger catacombs with slightly more labyrinthine layouts and even better rewards. There's Rises, which are taller buildings that require solving a puzzle to enter. There's also several areas that are structured similarly to Legacy Dungeons, but are just smaller in scale, like Castle Morn and the subterranean shunning grounds under Lane Dell. The rewards you get upon completing any of these tasks isn't just potentially useful gear either. It's an extra piece of lore and world building to enjoy, of which there is a ton as expected of a universe co-created by both Miyazaki and George R.R. Martin, who loves world building more than actually finishing a narrative. The lore bits might not mean much to every player, of course, but they do mean a ton to some players. And even beyond all of that, there's simply interesting enemy behavior to see scattered around the world, providing more character and dynamism to the setting itself. Mages summoning an alabaster lord, a big group of zombies shambling toward the ocean for some reason, villagers ignoring your presence entirely in order to dance, a nearby bat woman singing under the shade of a rock formation, enslaved giants pulling a huge carriage around, and even enemies fighting each other in their own contained little battles. This is all optional content, scattered around the map at such an impressive density that you're bound to come across one of these things if you merely pick a direction and ride forward for about 30 seconds or so. Technically, Legacy Dungeons are the only thing you need to actually do in order to progress the story. You can even beat the game without ever setting foot in either the Weeping Peninsula, Kaled, or Mount Gelmir. That means almost one-third of the entire world map is optional. To put it into even better perspective, depending on your criteria for what makes an enemy a boss, there's anywhere between 150 to 220 total bosses in the entire game, across all manner of content. But the bare minimum you need to fight in order to simply hit the end credits is about 13. Of course, if you try to rush through the game like that on your first playthrough, you're likely to get your ass kicked for hours on end by the story bosses you're far too undergeared for. But the point still stands, that technically, the massive lion's share of Elden Ring can be considered optional. But despite that, so much of it feels so captivating and substantial in both the experience and especially the rewards that we don't want to skip it. Every little thing that's accomplished feels meaningful in one way or another even if it doesn't directly contribute to the main questline. I've already seen streamers I personally watch go anywhere from 120 to 160 hours of playtime in Elden Ring, simply playing at their own pace and exploring every nook and cranny without the direction of any guides, all while being pretty competent at the game too. It just goes to show that Elden Ring is not the content of one Souls game stretched out across several square kilometers. It's the content of two or even three Souls games crammed into several square kilometers. And the legacy dungeons themselves help exemplify that, as some of them take four hours or more to completely clear out. Stormvale Castle by itself feels comparable to the entire first archstone of Demon's Souls. The scope of this game is truly remarkable and emblematic of how hardworking the FromSoft team is. The only downside is that this scope might be lost on people who don't really spend that time exploring. Overall, Elden Ring does an excellent job at letting the player create their own journey, even though the line of progress is still distinct and fairly rigid. And all this content is bolstered by the combination of great art design, minimal railroading, plethora of distinguishable landmarks that makes the world readable without a map, far draw distances, cohesive transitions from open world to smaller objectives, 
very little downtime away from the core gameplay loop, and reliable traversal. A good open world isn't just big spaces with nothing to do. In some cases, it does work, like Shadow of the Colossus, where the large, desolate map amplifies the emotional journey. But it takes a lot of deliberate planning and precise artistic direction to pull that off. You basically have to build the whole experience around the fact that the world is empty. Otherwise, other open world games want to be open world in order to better provide a sense of adventure, but certain overbearing mechanics, design shortcomings, or oversights prove to be counterproductive to that goal. They end up making the experience feel poorly paced, content starved, streamlined to a fault, or stricken with constant downtime away from the core gameplay loop that everyone actually cares about. Elden Ring does a fantastic job of completely sidestepping most, if not all, of these issues. Going forward, it's obviously going to be a major worry in the eyes of players that other companies might seek to copy Elden Ring's world design without fully understanding why it works so well. Seeing the game already being slammed by Western game designers for its bad UX is already kind of a symptom of that misunderstanding. I have no doubt in my mind that there's at least one big open world game currently in development somewhere that's being reevaluated in the face of Elden Ring's insane success. I can't tell you if it'll work out or not, but the history of games chasing trends created by From Software would suggest it probably won't. But hey, I can't tell the future. Only time will tell how, or even if, Elden Ring will really affect anything. This concludes my video on Elden Ring and open world design. I guess this could be considered an extension of my review. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you around.